Well, for well more than a century, people in this country, Americans, have made the case for socialism, but that seed has never really sprouted and taken root. But that's changing. Young Americans appear to be, every poll shows, souring on our economic system, capitalism. Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez set the agenda of the modern Democratic Party, and both of them call themselves socialists. It's affecting the presidential field. You can see it every day. Here's one example. On ABC recently, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont blasted his rival Elizabeth Warren with the worst insults he could think of. She's a capitalist, he said. Uh, but there are differences between Elizabeth and myself. Well, Elizabeth, I think, as you know, has said that she is a capitalist through her bones. I'm not. And the reason I am not is because I will not tolerate for one second the kind of greed and corruption and income and wealth inequality and so much suffering that is going on in this country today, which is unnecessary. Another difference is he might be actually even more self-important than she is. We'll let you decide. Any case, in 2019, that's a real attack on the left. My opponent is a capitalist. Whatever they choose to call it, the Democratic base is demanding socialist policies, and increasingly the candidates are happy to oblige. Tell you what I believe in terms of democratic socialism. I agree with what goes on in Canada and in Scandinavia, guaranteeing health care to all people as a human right. I think undocumented people need to have a means by which they can be covered when they're sick. Raise your hand if, gover if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. Socialism with open borders, that's the trend. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky is fighting it. He's got a brand new book out. It's called The Case Against Socialism. He joins us tonight. Senator, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. So um, congrats on the book, by the way. And I, bet, I think your book tour is probably a, a very kind of interesting window into where we are right now. My deeper question is, why are we there? Most of the economic indicators seem positive. Why are people embracing socialism? Well, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. I remember when I was a kid, we would say, well, that liberal, that liberal's probably a socialist, but they would never admit to it. Totally. Now you have people actually running on the label of being a democratic socialist. I think some of it is they've forgotten their history. So part of our book, we talk about the fact that Hitler was a socialist, the fact that Stalin was a socialist, the fact that Mao was, and that about 100 million people died in the last century primarily from genocide and famine, and primarily from collectivism and socialism. But they seem to have forgotten that. But what they now point to is they all say, well, we kind of were for Castro, but not so much. I mean, we kind of for Chavez and Maduro, but not so much. What we're really for is Scandinavian socialism. Uh -huh. So we spend a lot of the book uh, describing the fact that Scandinavia first is not socialist. But we also report that, you know what, Bernie's actually too much of a socialist to even get elected in Denmark. The Prime Minister of Denmark said, Bernie, quit calling us socialist. We're not socialist. We're open for business. <laughs> and you're ruining our business by telling the world we're socialist and we're not. Well, the socialism of Norway is based on oil deposits. It's, right. it's a petro-socialist state. Um, so what's interesting, though, is that conservative off, conservatives often say socialism makes people poorer. But the people who run socialist systems always wind up very rich, I've noticed. We, we make that point in the book that there's always a top 1%. In our country, it's largely based on merit. In socialism, it's largely based on who you know, whether yes. you're related to Maduro, you know, you are wealthy and can have plenty to eat. So, for example, in Venezuela, the average person has lost 20 pounds over the last year. Maduro has gained about 50 pounds over the last couple of years. So Maduro <laughs> is getting is that, bigger is that and literally bigger true? and bigger. Oh, yeah, he, he can't even put, wear clothes. I mean, and so Maduro is so fat, his generals are fat, they're all well-fed, but the average person has lost 20 pounds. That is a statement of what the top 1% is like in socialism. So it doesn't cure, I mean, because I think it is fair, this is a concern I have, if inequality becomes so profound, it causes instability in your society. I think it's part of the reason what we're seeing now. But socialism is not the cure for that. Right. And actually, we look at income inequality also and find that the studies by Thomas Piketty and others really aren't true. It actually turns out that if you look at income inequality in developed nations, income inequality is actually proportional to economic growth. It doesn't slow down economic growth at all. And really what we should be concerned about, you know, which society would you rather live in, where the average poor person makes $30,000 a year and the average rich person makes 100000 or the average poor person makes 60000 and the rich people make $4 million? It really shouldn't matter what a rich person makes. You really want the average that the poor folks make to be increasing, and that's what's happening in capitalism. Right. Envy is real. 
So I just I have to ask you uh, about the Syrian question, since you're one of the very few elected officials in Washington who appears to be at least sympathetic to the president's position that we ought to pull troops out of northern Syria. Why has the response been bipartisan and outraged, almost universal here, everyone hates this idea? It's sort of one of the strange compromises in Washington. They all seem to be in favor of continued intervention everywhere. They never believe you can come home. When President Trump talked about coming home from Afghanistan, the immediate response was it would be precipitous. And I'm like, 19 years and it's precipitous to come home. So really, it's really appalling, but there seems to be almost nobody really looking at the situation. But I will tell you one extraordinary thing. For months I've been saying, you know what, the best chance the Syrian Kurds have is actually making an alliance with Assad to protect them against the Kurds. That's already happening. As we speak, they're beginning to have an alliance. Their best chance of having some kind of autonomous zone is being part of Syria and reassuring Turkey that they're not going to be making incursions into Turkey. That's what happened in Iraq. There is a, a semi-autonomous yes. region for the Kurds, but they're within the government of Iraq. And they've gotten the uh, assurity that they're not going to invade into Turkey. Interestingly, there are 1,800 Turkish businesses in Kurdistan, the Kurdish area of Iraq now, and they actually are getting along pretty well. That could happen in Syria too, but we've prevented it because we keep saying you can't talk to Assad, Assad must go. But really, you probably do have to eventually talk to Assad course, to have peace there. Of course. It's not even clear why we're saying that. That's very confusing. Senator, thank you very much. Great thank to see you. you. Congrats on the book. Thank you.